My name is Matt Troop and I'm an intensivist at the Cleveland Clinic. Today I'm going to discuss proportional assist ventilation, which is the power steering of mechanical ventilation. The objectives for today are to discuss key principles, rationale, and describe what this mode really is, how to pick initial settings and how to titrate them, identify situations where this is not an appropriate setting, describe situations where it may be more likely to be beneficial, and finally summarize the state of the evidence. So first, in order to use any mode on the ventilator, we need to actually understand what it is. And if you want to learn more about understanding what a TAG is, a taxonomic attribute group, please visit the link in the QR code for a full free paper on this topic. All vent modes can be described by the following three parameters. The control var variable, which is pressure or volume, breath sequence, which would be continuous mandatory ventilation, continuous spontaneous ventilation, or intermittent mandatory ventilation, and then something called targeting scheme, which is how the vent achieves whatever goals you set for it. So for PAV, this is a pressure control type of mode. The breath sequence is continuous spontaneous ventilation. So this is a patient triggered and a patient cycled mode, similar to pressure support. The targeting scheme is the really interesting thing about this mode, and it's really what makes it a power steering mode. This is called servo targeting, not to be confused with the servo or ventilator. Servo targeting implies that inspiratory pressure is proportional to a patient's inspiratory effort. So in total, when you write this all together, it is PC CSV little r. How does servo targeting compare to other modes? Well, you can see as patient effort or PMUS increases, vent support or P vent also increases proportionally and that's where the proportional and the proportional assist comes from. Contrast this to commonly used modes like volume control, volume support, or PRVC where the more effort the patient gives the less support they get from the ventilator. And then finally pressure support or pressure control that amount of support is, that is provided does not vary at all based on what the patient effort is. So you can see they all have different advantages and disadvantages. Here's a graphical representation of what proportional assist ventilation might look like in terms of when you compare patient effort to the amount of pressure delivered, you can see for more and more effort, you get higher and higher inspiratory pressure from the ventilator. There are several potential advantages of this mode. First of all, you can match the inspiratory flow demand of the patient, which is something that is done very poorly in modes like volume control or PRVC. Because the amount of support is variable based on the amount of effort provided by the patient, diaphragm protection is something that potentially is occurring here. And then finally, this provides some normal variability. We all don't breathe a fixed tidal volume every single time we take a breath. And when we exercise, we'd like to increase our minute ventilation. Potential disadvantages, if someone has a very high respiratory drive, they could suffer from tidal volume overdose. On the flip side, if the patient has a very low respiratory drive, then hypoventilation can occur. And then finally, this mode has an unusual dyssynchrony pattern, which we'll discuss here in a moment. So how does this mode actually work? This is completely reliant on the equation of motion, which if you manage a ventilator, you need to know this equation. The pressure provided by the patient's muscles plus the pressure provided by the ventilator is equal to volume times elastance plus flow times resistance. PAV actually measures all things here that are highlighted in green. It obviously measures the tidal volume that you're breathing in, it measures the, amount, it measures the flow, and then it will calculate the elastance and the resistance in order to determine the total pressure that's needed to generate the breath. Here's an example of PAV screen on the Puritan Bennett 840 ventilator. You can see here there's this pause at the end of inspiration, and this occurs about every six or so breaths and allows the ventilator to calculate both the compliance and the resistance. And again, these are values that are needed to complete the equation of motion. You also see a peculiar setting here that's different from other modes of ventilation is called the percent support. So what does that actually mean? Remember that PAV is using the equation of motion to determine the total pressure needed to generate the breath. And this is a combination of PMUS and PVENT. When you set a percent support at 30% in this case, the PAV level is the percent of the total pressure the vent will provide. So in this case, the PMUS will have to do 70% of the total pressure needed. So the patient is getting less than half the amount of assistance needed to generate this breath. And you can titrate this according to some parameters that we'll discuss soon. Here's what initial settings might look like in PAV. Because we're calculating resistance, it's helpful to know what size the ET tube is and whether it is an ET tube or a tracheostomy. There's some safety parameters in terms of peak pressure and, and high tidal volume alarm. And then finally, there are some backup settings listed here in case the patient becomes apneic. The sensitivity of the vent to both trigger and cycle the breath is included in addition to your normal FiO2 and PEEP settings. This diagram from the Tobin textbook shows an easy way to start to titrate this setting. So you can start with an initial setting of 70% assist, and then if the patient consistently has a respiratory rate less than 35 and a tidal volume between 5 and 8 cc's per kilo, this is something that you can probably observe, at least temporarily. And then dial up or down the support by 10 to 20% over time so that you're meeting the patient's needs, allowing them to do some work but not doing too much work for them. Once your percent support gets down to 10 or 20%, you're essentially providing almost just CPAP, and you should consider extubating the patient or putting them on a spontaneous breathing trial if you feel like you still need to do that. 
So what are some situations when it makes sense to avoid PAV? As we discussed already, extremes of respiratory drive are probably a pretty bad situation to use PAV. Uh, you'll either have very high tidal volumes or very low tidal volumes. If you have leaks or bronchopleural fistulas, that's gonna interfere with the ventilator to cycle off from a flow standpoint, so that may cause issues. And personally, I will say that when there's high breath-to-breath -breath variability in the patient's effort, this mode has a hard time keeping up, so then I would be cautious about using it in somebody like that. When should you think twice about PAV? If there is subs if there is significant obstruction and intrinsic PEEP, it can make it difficult for the ventilator to both trigger and cycle, so that could be an issue. Furthermore, when you have a situation where you have obstructive lung pathology or high resistance, you can get what's called the runaway phenomenon. And this is a dyssynchrony that's specific to PAV and it does not occur in other modes. So you can see here in the yellow dotted line is where the patient is attempting to cycle off inspiration. In a runaway phenomenon, this breath will continue for perhaps as long as the initial inspiratory effort. And this is something you can only really see by keeping an eye on the vent waveforms. I will say that is not something that I have seen commonly, but it has been described in the literature. So when should PAV be considered? It really depends on what the primary goal of mechanical ventilation is for the patient at the time that you're assessing them. And the, the paradigm that we use is called safety, comfort, and liberation. And all these goals are important at different points in the patient's mechanical ventilation journey, but whatever your predominant goal should dictate what kind of modes and what kind of behaviors you, you enact. So when safety is the priority, we're trying to ensure a minimum, we're trying to ensure a minimum minute ventilation as well as minimize ventilator associated lung injury risk. When comfort is the priority, we're trying to enhance synchrony and balance work of breathing. And finally, a goal of liberation allows us to identify the ability to breathe spontaneously. PAV fits best into the framework where we're targeting comfort. This is somebody who is not severely acutely ill, maybe they're starting to improve, but they're not quite ready to be extubated yet. So some other ideas on when PAV should be considered. This is something that, at least in theory, could be diaphragm protective. The way we apply mechanical ventilation not only can cause injury to the lung, but can cause injury to the diaphragm in two main ways. Number one, over-supporting the diaphragm can lead to atrophy, which makes it difficult to wean from ventilation. On the other hand, under-assistance can lead to overwork of the diaphragm and pathological muscle growth, which also interferes with diaphragm function. Remember, because of the servo-targeting, the more effort the patient does, the more vent support they get here. So this is an appealing possible strategy for diaphragm protection. Because this is a spontaneous mode, it's important to talk about ways we might monitor safety. Obviously, overall tidal volume is something that we can monitor, but it may make more sense to monitor driving pressure. And that is something that is still achievable in PATH. Because the tidal volume is reported, the compliance is calculated, we can put those values together to determine what the driving pressure is. And remember, in most cases, a driving pressure less than 15 would be considered safe. When you think about exercising a patient on a ventilator, it would make sense to put them in a, it would make sense to use PATH as the patient will work harder, they will receive more support. Compared to pressure support in which the, le the level of support you're providing is linear no matter how much effort they're giving. In small studies, we've seen better work efficiency and smaller increase in oxygen consumption. A similar benefit has been demonstrated in non-invasive PAV uh, in COPD patients. What about for vent weaning? This systematic review and meta-analysis suggests an increased likelihood of weaning from the ventilator when using PAV compared to pressure support ventilation. In another meta-analysis, we see similar results with fewer days of mechanical ventilation compared to pressure support. Notice that that difference was not demonstrated when pressure support was compared to NAVA. Future directions in this area should include looking at PAV for sleep quality, as well as identifying patient-centered exercise and mobility outcomes. Furthermore, better guidance is needed on choosing settings, both initially and how to titrate it in PAV. It would be interesting to see how need for sedation and effects on delirium are mitigated by use of a mode that is, in theory, more comfortable to the patient. And then finally, we need to better define what's the timing of use of this, what phase of illness is PAV an appropriate setting. So in summary, PAV is an option to facilitate comfort and balance work of breathing. It may be beneficial for diaphragm protection, but it should be avoided at extremes of respiratory drive. If you have ventilators with a proportional assist ventilation mode, consider using them for weaning as they're likely beneficial for vent liberation as well as duration of mechanical ventilation, even when compared with pressure support. If you have any clarifying questions or comments, please leave them below. Otherwise, you can find me at the social media links here as well as on my website. Thanks for tuning in.